Well, today we are wrapping up our series called What Does God Want From Me Anyway? And as I share with you back at the beginning of the series, I put this together a couple months ago because I knew that with an upcoming political election that it was a very, very important that we talk about, all right, what does God really want from us when it comes to us being citizens of this particular country? And, you know, what does the future look like for our country as well? And I just wanted to make sure that we weren't getting extreme either way when it comes to our politics, but we're really doing what is it that God would have us to do? And so what we discovered is there's a great verse. It's found in the Old Testament. It's Micah chapter 6, verse 8. Hopefully by now you've gotten it sort of memorized, right? Micah, he says, hey, look, here's what God is wanting from you, right? Here's what God demands from you. Here's what he's commanding you to do. And he gives us three things that we're to do. Remember what they are? You're to act. Justly. Act justly. You are to love. Mercy. mercy and you are to Walk humbly with God. Now, what I've said to you throughout the series is you can't, like, take one of those three to an extreme. You have to make sure you keep them in balance. And so the illustration I've used for you is think of a stool, a three-legged stool. If even one of those legs comes out, then the whole thing topples over. So you need to make sure that you have perfect balance between acting justly, loving mercy, and then walking humbly with our God. Now, what we looked at then last week is Jesus basically comes along and says, look, if you want to do all three of those things and keep them in balance, he says, as I have loved you, now you must go and love other people. And so that, that's really the, the key to, to keep in balance is just simply love people in the same way that Jesus first loved us. So let's recap real quick. What does it mean to act justly? Well, basically to act justly means that you speak up for those who have no voice. Did you recognize that there are systems in our country, there are systems in the world that for whatever reason have oppressed people, kept them down, and it's our job as followers of Jesus to say, you know what, I'm going to be a voice for them because I have influence, and so I'm going to help bring them up. That's acting justly. Then we looked at loving mercy. What does love mercy? It simply means that you just simply serve other people. You say, it's not about me. It's not about what I want. I am going to put other people's interests before my own. I'm going to go out and I'm going to serve as many people as I possibly can. And then to walk humbly with God, as we discovered, that means that you acknowledge that, look, he's God and I'm not. He's God and I'm not. He has a better plan. He has a better way than I do. And so if he says in his word that we're supposed to do something, we do it. If he says not to do something, then we don't do it. So we have to keep all three of those in balance. Again, act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with our God. And how do we do it? Jesus says, as I have loved you, now you must go and love others. So as we wrap up this series here today, I want to do another controversial topic because what we did in the first three weeks is we looked at, okay, here's the foundational thing of what these three things are about, but then we've been looking at things of, all right, how does that relate to us then in our society? Last week, we looked specifically at politics. Today, this controversial topic isn't actually one that's for the world. It's actually for us as the church. And at first, it isn't going to sound all that controversial, but as we go through it, you're going to see that oftentimes it can be. And so here it is. This is the simple question we've got to ask ourselves. Who is the church for? When we gather together, who is the church for? Now, there's a lot of people that would say, well, the, the church is for the already convinced. Those that have already made a profession of faith in Jesus so that they can come in to worship. You can come in to learn about God and, and grow in a relationship with God. It's for us to come together in fellowship with one another and to hold one another accountable. Some people would say that, that that's what it would be. Then there'd be other people that would say, no, no, no. The church is actually for those that are not yet a part of us. That we gather together so we can invite other people to come in and, and be a part of, of who we are. And that a church can be a place that, that people can come in and sort of kick the tire, so to speak, on this whole thing called Christianity. Of, is Jesus real? Is his claims true or not? What about this thing called the church? What about this thing called Christianity? And so there's this debate that goes on back and forth of who is the church truly for? Is it for the lost or is it for the saved? Now, here's what's interesting. The controversy on this most of the time has nothing to do with what denomination you're a part of. You know where the divide comes? It's often a generational divide. And I'll explain it to you this way. The older you get and the longer you've been a follower of Jesus, the more likely it is you're going to start to want a church, whether it's this church or any church, to meet your needs. 
and your likes and your desires. Because as you're a follower, you have sort of this nostalgia of, you know what? When I got saved, this was the music they were doing. And these were the classes they had and the programs they had. This is the building that we met in. And so we get this, like, this nostalgia of, wow, that's what the church is. And, and we need to keep it that way. But what ends up happening then is younger people start to, to come in or younger people are growing and they're becoming teens and then young adults. They start to go, that was great for your generation. And it reached you. But my friends and, and myself, it's not really reaching me. And so there's this, this division that starts to happen. And what often happens is because the older you know, people, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, because they're the ones that are in their prime earning years and they're the ones giving the most money, and because they're seen as older and wiser and have influence, oftentimes the church just sort of gets stuck in what they're doing. And they don't end up changing to reach the next generation because, again, they have all the influence. Now, the younger people, they're going, yeah, but that's not reaching us. The younger people, they have the energy. They have the ideas to reach the next generation. But the older people go, nah, not really for us because we're happy with the way things are right now. And so for the younger ones, they want the church to be for those that aren't yet followers as we get older, a lot of times we think, no, it's just about us and, you know, our core of people that we have. And, and the, the, the thing with this is churches get stuck. They get older and older and older, and no changes come. And all of a sudden, you look around, everybody in the church is 70, 80 years old, and then they come to me as a consultant and go, what do we need to do to reach the next generation? And oftentimes, if you wait till that long, it's a little bit too late. And a lot of times, they don't even get to that place where they even want to reach the next generation. We have a lot of churches that I consult with. They basically, they're like, as long as we have enough money in the bank so we can keep the bills paid so I can die and be buried in the church cemetery then I'm going to be happy. And it is such a, a shame, and it's such a, a bad use of God's resources. I mean, I can literally give you dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of stories of churches that I've consulted with, that that's their attitude. Let's just keep the bills paid so we can die. And what I always try to tell them is, look, especially some of the older churches that have been you know, around for 100, 200 years, I'm like, People in other generations, they had to make sacrifices. They had to make changes in order to get to the place where the next generation could be here. So you are here today in this church because people through the years made those changes. And so you've got to learn to adapt. You've got to learn to change. But for many, they just sort of want to die out and let it go. And so that's what I want to talk to you about here today. Is what is that going to look like for us as exponential church. Because here's the truth of the matter. I'm not a spring chicken anymore. I'm 51 now. I know, I know, it, you know, it, it's the good exercise and the, the skin care, no, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> but no, I'm 51. And the average, you know, church, what, what we see is 10 years older and 10 years uh, younger than the senior pastor on average. So if I'm 51, that means that here at Exponential, 41 years old to 61 years old is going to be about the average attendance. And as you look around, that's basically who we are. Do we have some people that are a little bit older in their 70s? Yes. Do we have some people that are in their 30s and in their 20s? Yeah, we have that. But for the most part, we're in that age of, you know, 40 to 60. And so what we've got to look at now is how do we reach the next generation? Let's not wait until I'm 70 to go, oh no, what do we do? How do we reach the next generation for Jesus? This is so important that we start thinking of these things now that we're proactive in reaching the next generation instead of being reactive in the future. So if you got a Bible today, you want to turn to Luke chapter 6, verse 12. That's where we're going to start out. And then Matthew chapter 4 is the other key scripture we're going to look at today. 
Um, as you're turning there, I want to give you a, a little bit of just some context of the, the background of Jesus' 12 apostles. Now, apostle simply means a sent one. Apostles are the ones that, that start new things. Um, so there's five things in Scripture that we're told that everybody has a gift in. You're either an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, a shepherd, or teacher. Each and every one of you, if you're a follower of Jesus, you are one of those five things. Now, what typically happens then is it's your top two that sort of, uh, it's sort of your philosophy and, and how you act in ministry. So for me, I'm a teacher apostle. So what does that mean? It means that I have a gift to teach God's word, and most of the time that means I'm going to start new things. Why did Lisa and I move here to Harrisburg? To start a church. Why did I go to, to Chambersburg before I was here? To help them start a new outreach to the next generation. How did I get hired by Rick Warren in Purpose Driven Ministries? Because I had an idea to start something, to teach pastors. So again, I'm an apostle teacher. You have something as well that you do. But the 12 guys here that Jesus is going to choose as apostles were all apostolic. They had this gift to go and start new things. Jesus is going to handpick them to carry out his mission, his message, and his movement. So let's look at Luke chapter 6, verses 12 and 13. Jesus went up on a mountain to pray, and he prayed to God all night. At daybreak, he called together all of his disciples. Notice that, all of his disciples, and he chose 12 of them to be apostles. So I've been bringing this up to you a lot here recently. There are more than 12 disciples that Jesus had. Jesus had dozens and dozens and dozens of disciples. At one point, he sends out 72 of his disciples to go do ministry for him. So he has a lot of disciples. But here, he prays all night long in order to choose 12 of them to be apostles. These are going to be the leaders of this new thing called the church. This is Jesus' plan A. He's going to put it all into these 12. This is plan A, and there is no plan B. Either they do it, or it just doesn't happen at all. Now, I want you to put yourself into the sandal, so to speak, of Jesus. You only have one shot at getting this right. You're only choosing 12. So think about it. If, if you have this super important mission, and you need to choose 12 people to lead it, who are you going to choose? Shout out some ideas. Who would you typically think of that you're going to choose? You're going to choose some people that are already gifted in leadership, right? Uh, they're probably going to be a little bit older. They probably have a lot of gifts and skills and talents, abilities. Probably have some charisma so that they can draw people into the movement. And keep in mind, this is a religious movement. So you're probably going to want somebody that knows how to preach. You want somebody that knows how to teach, somebody that can lead worship. Isn't that where our mind would go of, man, I've got to get this right. I've got to choose 12, and I'm going to choose the best and the brightest, the most educated that are out there. I am going to get the, the, the cream of the crop here. But guess what? That's not who Jesus chooses. He actually goes the exact opposite way with this. Look at Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 to 22. One day as Jesus was walking along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers Simon, also called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net into the water, for they fished for a living. Jesus called out to them, come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. And they left their nets at once and followed him. A little further up the shore, he saw two other brothers, James and John, sitting in a boat with their father Zebedee, repairing their nets. And he called them to follow as well. So four of the 12 are actually fishermen. Now, I've shared with you in the past, every little boy growing up in Israel wanted to be what? Who remembers? They wanted to be a, yeah, a rabbi. They wanted to be a, a teacher of God's word. Every little boy wanted to. We grow up wanting to be astronauts and baseball players and, you know, doctors and nurses and whatever. But they wanted to be a rabbi. So they went through a schooling. And at a very early age, most of them, most of them were told, you know what? It's obvious that you love God, but you don't have what it takes to be a rabbi. You go home and you learn your family's occupation. So in the story, we read that four of these guys were doing what? They were 
fishing, that means that what happened to them when they were young. They flunked out of rabbi school, basically. They were told, you don't have what it takes to be a leader in God's kingdom. So they're basically very uneducated men, these four of the 12. And I want you to notice in the case of James and John, it says that they were still in their boat with their father. They weren't even to the place yet that they were even skilled enough to have their own boat. They're still working with their dad. So they're not very skilled. Then here's something else to think about. Matthew chapter 17, Jesus is with the 12 apostles and a tax collector comes and he wants to collect the tax. Jesus looks to Peter and he says to Peter, I want you to go catch a fish and inside the fish's mouth, you're gonna find a coin that's gonna pay your tax and mine. Now think about this for a second. Jesus is with all 12. But he tells Peter that the coin is only going to pay Jesus' tax and Peter's tax. Why wouldn't he offer to pay everybody's taxes? The answer is quite simple. They weren't yet old enough to have to pay taxes. You didn't start paying tax until you were 20 years old there in Israel. Now, there's another clue that we have that the disciples were, or the apostles were really, really young, and that is only Peter was married. Now, it doesn't mean that the others weren't, but we don't have any record of any of the others. So between Jesus saying that only, you know, this coin's going to pay for Peter and I's tax and that Peter was married, the assumption, again, we can't prove it, but the assumption is that Peter, maybe Matthew, were the only ones that were above the age of 20. Meaning, everybody else is still teenagers. Now think back to what I said earlier. You're Jesus and you have to choose 12 to go change the world. Would grabbing a bunch of teenagers be the first thing that comes to your mind? <laughs> no. But yet that's exactly what Jesus does. He grabs these young people and he says, I'm going to put together my dream team. You guys are my dream team, and I'm going to give you an assignment that we're going to go out and we're going to together change the world. That's what he does. He recruits them, and then he spends time with them. He eats with them. He teaches them. He mentors them. He coaches them. He trains them for this mission that they're eventually going to carry out. Guess what I'm saying to you is Jesus didn't just say that the next generation was important. He actually invested in the next generation. He actually showed the next generation that I believe in you. I believe in you. I've shared this with you before that, you know, a lot of people say the four most important letters in the English language are L-O-V-E. And that's probably true, right? The love. But there's four other letters that are just as equally important. It's the letter I. It's the letter C. It's the letter N and it's the letter U. Now put it all together. I see in you. I see in you. I see in you potential. I see in you the opportunity to go out and to change the world. I see in you the, the, the ability to be a difference maker for God's kingdom, and that's exactly what Jesus is doing here for these young men. I see in you. Not what the world sees, that you're uneducated, that you're young. I see in you that you can make a tremendous difference for the kingdom of God. So Jesus doesn't just say that it's important. He actually models for us what intergenerational ministry looks like by believing in them and investing in them, training them, and sending them out. And, you know, as I reflect back on my own life, I've been so blessed through the years as I was younger, when I was in my 20s and I was in my 30s, to have people that were older, they were in their 30s, their 40s, their 50s and older, that said, Gilbert, I see in you the ability for God to do great and mighty things through your life. And I want to come alongside you. I want to invest in you. And so we had couples that would come to Lisa and I and they modeled for us what a good, healthy marriage, marriage would look like. They modeled for us what generosity looks like. They modeled for me what leading a church could look like, 
what preaching looked like, what changing the world could look like. I guess what I'm saying is I'm getting to the place now that I realize now it's my time to speak into that next generation. And it's your time as well. Because we as Exponential Church, we can't wait another 10 or 15 years and then say that we want to reach the next generation because by then it's going to be too late. We need to be very, very intentional about reaching young people and raising them up and saying, I see in you. Now, by the way, there's actually benefits to you and I doing this. Like for you and I. It's not just going to benefit them. There's actual studies that have been done that show that when older adults invest in young people, and and not like your family members, but like you're intentionally investing in somebody that it's your choice to invest in them, that you're going to be less depressed, you're going to have better physical health, you're going to have a higher degree of life satisfaction, and you're going to have more hope for the future. In other words, science confirms what Jesus modeled for us and what Jesus asked us to do. Now, I bring all this up here today because you're like, what does this have to do with our series and politics and and the upcoming election and everything like that? Well, a lot of us, you know, when it comes to our country, we go, well, it's the next generation. You know, that's what's ruining our country. It's the millennials. It's the alpha generation. They're the problem. Well, as long as we as as, you know, citizens of the country and then as followers of Jesus, as long as we're doing that type of thing, we're pointing our finger that you're the problem? Well, yeah, there's going to be a divide. And so we have got to be intentional about how do we bridge that divide. And you know how we do it? There's three things that we do with them. Guess what those three things are? We act justly, we love mercy, and we walk humbly with God. Remember in week one of the series, I said that every single generation, they tend to stress one of them more than the others. Remember in the people that grew up in the 1950s and the 60s and and, and that uh, type of age, remember they were the ones that were like, we're all about the word of God. Don't smoke, drink, chew, or run with girls who do, right? It's all about, man, we've got to keep it right to the word of God. And they became very, very legalistic, and they neglected then acting justly in loving mercy. And then my generation came around. Remember what I said? My generation, Gen Z, what were we, what were, or, uh, Gen X, I mean, you remember what we were all about? All about love and mercy, compassion. We all have a Compassion International child that we sponsored. We were hands across America. You know, we are the world. That's who we were. The current generation, what are they all about? It's acting justly. Standing up for the the things that are oppressing people economically, racially, socially. So by being very, very intentional about not only having a, a, a person in your life that's younger than you that you're investing in, but then having somebody that's of a generation older than you. When we truly have intergenerational ministry together, guess what that's going to do? It's going to help to balance us out. Remember I said it's like that three-legged stool. We have to have balance. You can try to have balance on your own, but it's easier if you have others that they have a passion about one of the two that you don't or two of the three that you don't. So it's, it's very, very important that, again, each and every one of us, we're investing in somebody younger, and we have a relationship with someone older as well. Here's, again, what the studies have shown from a scientific standpoint. It's that when you are in relationships that are intergenerational, you actually will become more empathetic. Empathy, of course, meaning that, that you understand somebody else's perspective, that you're putting yourself into their shoes. You feel what they feel. And our empathy needs to increase because there's going to be times when it comes to other generations that you go, I just don't understand you guys. <laughs> why, why do you do that? Whether, again, it's an older generation or a younger generation, we all have those times where we're like, I just don't understand why you're doing that, why you choose the culture that you have, the values that you have, the clothes that you wear, the, the music that you have, the, the tattoos that are all over your body. we tend to, again, divide by generation more so than we do over doctrine 
or denomination. We've got to be very, very careful about that. And so the more empathetic we get by just spending more and more time with people, what we learn is that instead of needing to defend ourselves or our preferences or our choices, empathy allows us to focus on the other person and engage with them in a spirit of curiosity and a spirit of love that I really want to know who you are and what you're about and why you value the things that you do. Because as they get to know you and you get to know them, all of a sudden now it's going to be easier to work together to make a difference for the kingdom of God. And the bigger difference we can make for the, uh, the kingdom of God, the bigger difference that's going to make for our country here as well. Now, let me say this. The same way that I said it last week, when it comes to like differences of values or, or culture and everything, we don't turn a blind eye to sin. You know, if something is black and white, it is clear that this is sinful we don't just say, oh, well, that's just what the other generation does. The word of God is still the word of God. If God says to do it, we do it. If he says not to do it, we don't do it. But what I'm saying to you is in everything else, we have to allow other generations to have their own distinctness. And especially when it comes to the next generation, because that's who we would need to you know, try to reach for Jesus. So here's my question to you. Do you today have a close relationship with someone of another generation who is not a family member or a coworker? Now, the reason I throw a coworker in there is like a lot of times you're just forced to be beside somebody that's of a different generation. And that is helping you to understand them a little bit. But I'm saying, no, somebody that you intentionally, you're spending time with that's outside of your generation. Are you doing that very, very intentionally and learning from them and seeking to understand their experiences and their emotions, their perspectives? And then together, helping each other to either, you know, come to Jesus if they don't yet have a relationship or then grow in a relationship with Jesus so that you can work together to fulfill his message. Again, I especially want to say this to those of you that are like me, that you're, you're getting a little bit older. Are you investing in young people so that the mission of Jesus can continue? Because I don't know if you've seen the statistics of, like, what's happening in our country church-wise. Like, each generation, church attendance and, and what people believe as far as Christianity goes, it just keeps going down, 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 down. The number one demographic now in the United States is not Christianity or a Muslim or a Buddhist or a Hindu or whatever. The, the number one thing that people check on the census is the box, religious affiliation, check, none. The nuns. And not the cute little old ladies in the habits. N-O-N-E. So again, our, our job is to make sure that Christianity goes well beyond our lifetime. And so we've got to do a better job reaching that next generation, the millennials and the Gen Zers and the, the alpha generation as well. In the book of Acts, which is the, the start of the, the church, this is after Jesus' death, it's after his resurrection. He, he spends the first 40 days after his resurrection, he's walking the earth, he's, he's proving to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that he is truly alive again. And then he, one more time, he, he gathers together the 12. Because he's about to return back to the Father. He spent three and a half years investing in them. He says, now it's time. It's, it's time for me to go and you to do what I've trained you to do. And keep in mind, again, these are, these are guys that are in their teens or early 20s. Here's what Jesus says. It's in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. He says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Did you catch that? Jesus is entrusting this mission to a bunch of teenagers. But he says, you're not going to be alone. I'm giving you my spirit to help you to do it. And I want to say the same thing to you today. God's spirit is in you. If you're a follower of Jesus, the same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of you. And that spirit will empower you to be able to go out and to reach that next generation. To be able to relate to them. 
and to be able to, to have the, the knowledge to raise them up so that they can become the leaders that God is calling them to be today. Not tomorrow, but the leaders today in God's church. And Jesus says, you're going to take this mission not just to our local city here of Jerusalem, not just to our region of Judea, not just to the Samaritans, which, you know, we, we've talked about the Samaritans. They were people of a completely different culture. Not just that. He says, you're going to take this message and this mission to the ends of the world. And that's what we're called to do as followers of Jesus, is to help raise up people, to disciple people, not just to be disciples themselves, but to be disciple makers. And it's your job and it's my job to make sure that that happens. And so if we want to see change in the next generation, the key isn't who we vote for in this upcoming election. The key is who are you investing in. Who are you investing in? Because imagine if every single follower of Jesus truly started to invest in a younger person and raise them up to be leaders. Not only will they become leaders in the church, they're going to become leaders in our nation as well. So if you want to see our nation changed, if you want to cliche, make America great again, whatever that means, Again, it's not about your vote. It's about you investing in young people. And it may not happen in your generation. It may take, take generations, but it will come. It's what we looked at last week. It wasn't about how they voted. They didn't vote the Roman Empire out. They didn't, with violence, get the Roman Empire you know, to go away. What did they do? They did what Jesus commanded. They started to love one another. And the church had such an impact that within 300 years after Jesus' resurrection, the Roman Empire said, we're making Christianity the official religion of the empire. So again, it may, it may not happen in your lifetime. But you've got to think beyond your lifetime. You've got to think of a legacy that you're going to leave behind and so your legacy has nothing to do with how fancy of a car you had or how big of a house you had, how many vacations you went on. Nothing to do with that. Did you get your kid into the right school or onto the right soccer team? Nothing to do with any of that. It has to do with were you not just a disciple yourself, but a disciple maker. We've got to invest in people, especially in young people. And collectively, then those young people will change our country. Now, I know a lot of you are going, Gilbert, that sounds really, really good. We should do that. And I'm saying, you're absolutely right. We should do that. Here's why you're going to push back. It's one word, and the word is innovation. You're going, innovation? Why is that a bad word? You know, creating new things and everything. Well, let me just tell you that innovation is basically a fancy way of saying change. Anytime you're innovating something new, that means that the old has to go away. And change comes. And there's an old pastor's joke that says this, and he's, he's a pastor, he's, he's heard this one before. The seven last words of a dying church are simply this. We've never done it that way before. <laughs> We've never done it that way before. And I see this all the time as I'm out consulting. People with their lips say, yes, we want to make changes. Yes, we want, to, we want to, you know, have the next generation. But then you start to say, well, here's what we would need to do. And they go, well, you know, we've never done it that way before. Change is scary. And so people say, it's easier just to keep things the way it is, just to maintain the status quo. But then all of a sudden they look around and everybody's in their 70s and their 80s and they're just trying to keep the bank account with enough money in it so they can die and go into the cemetery. So again, what I'm saying is we need to be proactive now. 
now in reaching the next generation. So we got to learn to embrace the new because that's what younger people are going to want to do. New styles of music, new ways to utilize a building, new technology, new ministries, new programs. I should have had Andy actually come up and give a testimony about this. How is Andy, the senior pastor of a church, leading music here today? It's because they actually meet house to house. Their old church, they sold their building, what, two years ago now? Sold the building and said, we're going to meet house to house now. And so they meet all through the week, and they have a, what, once a month gathering? Yeah, so once a month, they gather together, have a time of worship together corporately. Now, I'm not saying that everybody has to do what they did, but that's what I'm saying is change isn't always easy. Change can be scary. But it's necessary. And so, again, we need to learn to embrace new music, new technology, new ministries, new programs. You're going, but Gilbert, it's just better the way we currently do it. It's easier the way that we currently do it. Yes, for you it is. And it's what reached you. But it may not reach the next generation. By the way, because I know some of you are going, I don't know about this Andy guy. That doesn't sound very biblical. Actually, you know what they're doing? It's actually more biblical than what we're doing here. Because as you read through the, the book of Acts, what do you read? Where were the churches meeting? House to house. Yeah, there were still the, the temple courts and, 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 you know, the synagogues and everything. But that was for the Jewish people. And the Christians were sort of going into where they weren't necessarily welcome all the time. So they've actually taken something old and made it new, essentially, right? And that's Solomon said, there's nothing new under the sun. But every generation, you know, it's like clothing, Right? Clothing goes out of style, and then 30 years later, it comes back in the style. And so it's the same way with the church. And again, you're going, oh, I liked it the old way. It was better. Well, maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. But I love what my former boss, Rick Warren, he writes about this. He, he says this, quote, The problem with the good old days is that they weren't really all that good. Most of the time, the only good thing about them is that they're over. The good old days usually look better in hindsight than they really were. We easily forget about old difficulties when we're faced with new challenges. And again, in my role as a consultant, I see this all the time that people are like, you know, we just long for the glory days of how things used to be. And what I always remind them is in the glory days, the reason that they were so glorious was because the mission of Jesus and the movement of Jesus was going forward. That you were reaching people that you were reaching the current and next generation. And oftentimes to do that, it meant that you were doing new and innovative things. And so it's not about maintaining the past. It's about what do we need to do to reach into the future. And so here's something I've said to you before. I'll say it again. It's on your outline. The message never changes, but our methods must. Listen. Listen. The gospel is always the gospel. The word of God is always going to be the word of God. That doesn't change. But how we present the gospel, the methods that we use, that does need to change from generation to generation. Look, the church has never been about hymns or organs, revival services, altar calls, flannel graph, fancy moving lights, or even projectors. Never been about those things. The church has always been about the gospel message. And at one time, all those things I just listed were innovative tools used to reach the next generation. The message didn't change, but the methods did. That's what I'm saying again. Let's not wait another 10 or 20 years. Let's now start to be thinking, what do we need to do corporately as a church body? What do we each need to be doing individually to reach the next generation? And again, I'll ask that question. Who are you investing in? Who are you investing in that isn't the church of tomorrow, but they're actually called to be the church of today? That's our job. So my question to you is this. 
What are you willing to let go of? What are you willing to let go of? That, yeah, it was important to you and and you coming to faith in Christ, or it was important for you and growing. Are you willing to let go of that? If there's something that's going to be better, a better method to reach somebody else, will you be willing to let go of that? And again, who are you investing in? Who are you going to empower and equip like Jesus did? We got to start doing this today. Okay, and we do have an election that's coming up here in less than, what, three months now. And whether you call yourself a Democrat or a Republican, you call yourself an independent, I believe all of us want what's best for our country. But what's best for our country is if every single man, woman, boy, and girl said, you know what? We're going to act justly. We're going to love mercy. We're going to walk humbly with our God. And we are going to love other people just as Jesus loved people. Again, so many politicians, they want the justice part, they want the mercy part, but they take the God part out of it. And so it's not about us voting in morality and trying to to legislate morality. It's about you and I being who Jesus called us to be. Not followers just when we meet together in a church building. The followers of his 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Again, people who act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God. Loving people just as Jesus commanded. If you want to see change, let it start in you. And then you go, and you invest in somebody else. And all of a sudden, this multiplication factor will happen. We'll call it exponential, if you will. That is the exponential impact that we can have. And that's what will make our country great again. Let's pray. Father, we uh, thank you for these past six weeks. We thank you for this opportunity to once again dig into your word and look to see what you have to say. Not our own thoughts, not our own opinions on what our country should look like and who to vote for or not to vote for or whatever, but to look at, at your word. And this simple, simple reminder that we are to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly with you, our God. Lord, my prayer is that each and every one of us would simply do that. That in every single circumstance, every single situation, we would ask ourselves, what would be the just thing to do here? What would be the merciful thing to do here? What is it that Jesus would do here in accordance to the commands of God? And then we would simply do that, that we wouldn't listen to our own heart. We wouldn't listen to what the media says. We wouldn't listen to even what politicians are saying to do. We would always follow you. What is the just, merciful, and and the humble thing to do? And Lord, then help us just go and model that for others and teach others to do it as well, especially for those that are of a younger generation. Lord, we know that you use the the 12 apostles, these, these young people, to change the world, we're standing here and and we're listening and watching online over 2,000 years later because these 12 young people did what you saw in them, the potential to be world changers. And Lord, I know you see in us today the ability to do the same thing, whether we're young or old. You see in us the ability to make a difference in our country and all around the world. And you give us the promise that your spirit is going to be with us to help us to do that. So Lord, I just pray that each and every one of us would be obedient to those things. Act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with our God. Thank you, Jesus, in advance that you're going to do that in and through us. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.